Hello everyone, thanks again for joining me this evening. Tonight we're going to be looking at having difficult conversations, which isn't always an easy thing to do, hence the term difficult conversation. Now, the thing about a difficult conversation is, if you ever notice, there's no such thing as a good time for a difficult conversation. There's always going to be a reason to put it off. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's raining outside, there's a birthday coming up, whatever it is, there will always be a reason to put that conversation off. I am thinking, of course, in terms of if we have to have the conversation, there will always be a reason for us to have to put it off. But like all things, the things that we're uncomfortable with, the longer we put things off, the more we put things off, the more difficult they are the more difficult it is to do or to say something that we need to do. So in order to have a difficult conversation, it's worth paying attention to what makes it difficult. Now, it could be difficult because we think that person is much more powerful than us. We think they're just going to talk us down. We might fear being rejected. We might fear things will get worse. We'll get punished somehow. There could be a lot of different reasons for this as well, by the way. It could be maybe we were taught to respect people in authority for what, you know, whatever reason, or teachers and so on. It could be that we were punished anytime we did stand up for ourselves. It's going to be a lot of different reasons, but when we pay attention as to what makes it a difficult conversation, still doesn't mean it's not a conversation we don't need to have. So when we think about what it is that makes it a difficult conversation, then maybe they're the things that we start to address. Now, if this is maybe a difficult person, like I know a lot of people watching my channel, they've been in relationships or they are in relationships with, with narcissistic people, they can be very difficult to have a conversation with. When we're having a conversation with someone like that, it tends to be there tends to be a lot of deflection, there tends to be a lot of blame shifting, tends to be a lot of circular reasoning, non-logical logic, and it's very difficult to tie down. So often we we come away feeling a lot more frustrated than we went in. But also, when we're having uh, conversations with people like that, there can be little things planted in our heads as well that you know maybe it's wrong to say no we're just being selfish we're being mean um we will be rejected because they never back down it doesn't matter how ridiculous or whatever or how stern they are whatever it is whatever they're arguing about they never back down they're not open to new information so we always feel as if we're getting nowhere and these little things get implanted in them talked one time before about inner gaslighting, the, the narratives we pick, we pick up. So we might be thinking in terms of this person is more powerful than me. This person is going to reject me. This person is going to run circles around me. If we believe that when we're going into the conversation, it's almost like we already assume we're going to lose. So we maybe don't assert ourselves as much as we should. Now, I'm going to talk you through a little exercise just to show you something. It's not really something I can do over over webcam. It's something I would uh, maybe do in the therapy room, but just to highlight something. Sometimes I will ask someone, talking about these narratives that we create, I will ask them to say out loud 10 times that they are weak and powerless. And that's usually a bit of a shock whenever you say that to someone. But, you know, I ask them to indulge me. I'm trying to show them something. So they might say, OK, I am weak and powerless. And they say that 10 times. When they finish saying it, I'll just ask them to put their hand out. And when they hold their hand out, I will just take mine gently, just the lightest bit of pressure. And I can push it down. Little to no effort. But then I ask them again. I ask them to say again. 10 times out loud, I'm strong and powerful. And they do. They say, I'm strong and powerful out loud. When they finish saying that 10 times, I'll ask them again to put their hand out. But this time, same amount of pressure. And there's a bit more resistance. If you want to try that with a friend or someone you feel comfortable with, just to get the point, um, it's quite a fun little exercise. But it's shown the narratives that we take on board that inner critic that tells us we're weak and powerless. 
I will ask them as well, what did they notice the two different times? They'll say the first time, maybe they were looking at their feet. Maybe they were mumbling. They were saying it even with an element of resistance. They didn't want to be saying it. So I ask them the second time, you know, what did you notice different the second time? And they might say things like, well, this time I was sitting with my back straight. I was breathing from my diaphragm, not from my, not from my chest. I wasn't shallow breathing. I was making eye contact. So they even notice the differences, even in their own body language. So it's worthwhile paying attention to those inner narratives. We go into that difficult situation or that conversation telling ourselves we're weak and powerless. We don't stand a chance. We're not going to get anywhere. Chances are we won't. So it's worth paying attention to that. The other thing to think of, even if this is a, even if this is a narcissistic person, by the way, I often think the advantage that people have is people can think ahead. They can think of outcomes. They can think a day in advance, a week in advance, a month, sometimes even years in advance. If you're dealing with someone who's narcissistic, think they think very much in the here and now. They think very much in instant gratification, instant wins. So that's kind of the dynamic that you're going to be dealing with. If you're aware of that, it's maybe thinking not how you can manipulate that, but you can think about, again, what is your preferred longer term outcome, knowing that you're going to be meeting little short obstacles along the way to give them instant, instant wins. You also get to think outside of the narrative that they've given you with those little instant wins. For instance, narcissistic person might say, if you continue to do that, or if you don't give me what I want, they might give you an ultimatum in order to shut the conversation down. It might be something like, if you don't do what I say, I will never talk to you again. Again, because of those inner narratives that we had, the things that have been implanted, we're often thinking, well, they're the only choices I have. I either do what's in my own best interest, but then they'll never talk to me. Or I just give in and give them what they want. They will talk to me, but I don't get my needs met. So we're often led to believe that they are the only choices we have. Not necessarily so. Remember, ownership, responsibility. We don't make people do things. The most we'll ever do is influence someone. Well, they're exactly the same. What we can say, we don't even have to say it out loud. We can keep it in here. It's not always safe. You don't know where narcissistic rage is going to take you. If that person doesn't speak to me again, that is their choice. It's not mine. They're the ones making the choice. So if you will, we're keeping responsibility for ourselves, but we're also allowing them the responsibility for their own actions, for their own behavior. I think it's important as well to recognize your battles. It may be an important conversation, but it's understanding why it's important. Why does it need to be said? What is it you're hoping to get from it? What, what is also pay attention to what is it you're actually feeling? Sometimes we'll say I'm nervous. And that could well be the case. Um, I'm frightened. And again, that could well be the case. Sometimes we will be saying, I'm very, very angry. Again, that could well be the case. When we go a little bit further, a little bit deeper, well, I feel uncertain. I feel unsure because I'm not sure how this is going to go. I feel this is really unfair. I'm feeling threatened. When we get a better sense of what it is we're actually feeling, we're more able to regulate those emotions, we're more able to use them to inform us rather than to make the decision for us. So we understand why it's important, what it is we're actually feeling, and what it is we actually want to get from it. Some things are maybe just better left alone. We're just really, really annoyed. Nothing's going to change, in which case we have to think about how we change ourselves. Other times, maybe we do need some kind of confrontation. Again, looking at narratives, fearing confrontation, I think a lot of people do. I'll include myself in that. I'm not good with confrontation. But when we think of confrontation, it doesn't have to be antagonistic. I always say when we're arguing with someone, we're not trying 
to antagonize anybody. A confrontation can open up a whole line of understanding and a whole line of communication that hasn't been there before. Sometimes you might be dealing with someone who isn't that toxic. They aren't that nasty. They just don't understand the impact of what they're doing. Once they know, maybe they'll change their behavior. If the person is toxic, if they are narcissistic, and if they are still talking around in circles, maybe the question is how you have the conversation. Recognize the kind of conversation before you actually have it. What kind of conversation are you having? Is it going to be, um, let me see. Is it going to be about what happened? Something has happened. So you're going to be talking about what happened. Is it going to be a kind of conversation where it's about feelings? What you think and what you feel about something, about their behavior, about your behavior, about a situation, whatever it is. When you get a sense of what the conversation is, you think about what your preferred outcome would like to be. What's the behavior you would prefer? When people focus on the person, when they put the focus on the person, you're a bad person, you bad people do this. When it's very judgmental, people tend to get very defensive. We get defensive, they'll get defensive. Everybody gets defensive. But when we think of the kind of conversation and we think of the outcome we would prefer, we focus on the behavior we would prefer, the outcome we would prefer. Do your best not to personalize it. Some people are going to take it personally anyway, but we keep it factual and we keep it, <coughs> pardon me, keep it focused on the outcome, okay? The resolution might not necessarily be one that makes everybody feel better, but it might be the resolution that's needed. So sometimes we need to be prepared to compromise a little. Also be prepared that we're not going to get everything we want, but we might, might get it in stages. If we're in one of those arguments, one of those discussions where it's all about labeling, it's all about judging. It's all about you're this, you're that, you're the other thing if it wasn't for people like you there's a lot of generalizations whenever it's about feelings and things like that you know we're again going back to those narratives no is selfish standing up for yourself is being aggressive they can go nowhere because it's focused more on personalizing things it's more focused on insulting it's focused more on shutting something down so nothing is going to be resolved so some skills to think about when you think about the type of conversation you want to have when you think about what it is you're thinking, what you're feeling, why it's important, why you've picked this particular battle, something to do, first thing, is actually listen. Now, I know that's going to sound strange because you may be dealing with a very toxic person who's talking around the circles, they're just deflecting, they're talking about the weather, they're talking about the time, their great aunt Flo, something, you know, whatever. It's not really anything to do with what the topic is, but you try to keep it on topic. And whenever they're talking, you listen. Now, this is the importance of listening, even though they're not listening to you. When you're listening to them, psychologist guy called Carl Rogers, he developed a whole person-centered approach to counseling. He believed in the power of listening. Now I'm gonna paraphrase him. Um, the more someone talks, the more they get the, the more they get to hear themselves the more someone talks the more they learn about themselves so we keep the person talking if you will we can be we can be curious we can be politely curious now, i know that is difficult with word salad nonsensical reasoning insults threats and so on but when we actively listen to someone we can pick up on things that we might not have seen before we might pick up on, on things like nuance. We might pick up on body language, tone of voice. We might pick up on subtext. We can pick up on a lot of things. The important thing about listening is we just might learn something, something we didn't know before. We might learn a perspective that we didn't know before. We might learn something that makes something a little seem a little bit more sense to us. When we're asking them, as I say, we're curious, we can paraphrase back to them what they said. Now, not in a straw manning kind of way like they do. They might do rather. And what I mean by that is not picking up on something and giving it a meaning that it didn't have. 
they might, for instance, they might be um, saying something like, you're very selfish because you won't give me what I want. So we could paraphrase that back. So it sounds like you're upset because I can't give you that. You're just showing them that you've heard them. You're not agreeing with them. You're not colluding with them, but you're showing them that you've heard them. And sometimes that can be enough to take the tension out of something, for someone to feel heard, for someone to feel listened to, even if it's a narcissistic person who's been very, very rude. But you're trying to understand their point of view. You're trying to understand by asking them questions like, tell me more about that, help me understand what that means. And you're picking up on all of the different little subtexts. Now, I'll give you an example of listening to someone actively. It's a guy I know, he sells cars, okay? And he told me that when he was training to be a car salesman, the guy that was training him taught him something that he's used in a lot of different areas of his life. <coughs> Pardon me, it's hay fever, I think. Um, he said that sometimes you sell somebody a car and they come in and there's a complaint about the car. And it could well be a genuine complaint. There could be something up with the car. But sometimes you get someone and they come in and they're just angry. They're just waiting for a, a fight. They're waiting for an argument. They, they're expecting some kind of resistance. So there's a lot of personalized stuff about the salesman being the horrible person, being a fraud and things like that. What he said was what he was taught to do was to listen to every word that was being said. Don't argue back, just paraphrase little things, take down a few notes that he thinks might be important, you know, about what's going on with the car and so on. And the more he listens to them, eventually they run out of steam. And once they run out of steam, then they work on the resolution. I thought that was a really good bit of advice and it's very kind of Rogerian in that, listen to people. It can sometimes help diffuse something, okay? To help with the act of listening, we're not actively listening. Whenever someone is talking and we're thinking of what our comeback is, we're thinking of how do we respond. We're not actively listening if we're interrupting. We're not actively listening if we're rushing them. We're not actively listening if we're, if you will, only really pretending to listen. We're, we're so used to hearing it, we just shut off. We go into defensive mode ignoring what they're saying. We're not really listening. But if we're making eye contact, we're doing little things like paraphrasing and we're not interrupting them and we're trying to pick up on things, then we are actively listening. So as I say, when we listen, we can sometimes find something new or we can find maybe a way through the defenses in order to get what it is we need. Secondly, we be clear about what it is we want, what it is we need. We can talk about how we feel, yeah. When we talk about how we feel, it's we own it. We're not saying you did this, you make me feel whatever. When you do that, I feel. When you do that, I think. As you do that, I'm whatever. We own what we feel. We're not necessarily using an emotive argument like narcissistic people often do, or just difficult people in general. We're owning what it is we actually feel, but we're still focusing on the preferred outcome. And we are being clear, we're being concise, and we're aiming for a positive outcome. We're being clear about what it is we want. We can be, we can be stern, but gentle and respectful at the same time. So we focus on the issue that's to be resolved, not necessarily personality traits and characteristics, not necessarily judging the other person. When we're being clear and concise as well, what we're not doing, think of the weak and powerless thing. What we're not doing is we're not looking at our feet. We're not mumbling and we're not apologizing for asking for whatever it is we need or for asking for something to stop or for whatever it is. We're not apologizing for it. Again, we might be sitting with our back straight. We're making eye contact and we're trying to sound as clear and concise as possible. We're being honest. We're also being honest again about what it thinks, what, what we think and what we feel. Not just saying it makes me angry, but why does it make me? 
Why does it make me angry? Again, I think that's really unfair. I think that's unreasonable, whatever it is. Now, here's the important thing. If things aren't going to plan, if you're dealing with someone who is maybe very narcissistic and the narcissistic rage comes up, there's no telling where that's going to take them. There's no telling what's going to happen next. If that's rising up, maybe it's best to back off. Again, the last thing we want to do is antagonize someone. Last thing we want to do is, you know, have someone explode. If it's not being resolved and if anger is coming up, it might be about just trying to distance ourselves. Cut it a break. It's the thing about arguing. I always say um, you can't shake hands with a clenched fist. Um, it might be just trying to get a space, trying to get a little bit of space. It's okay to take the break maybe agree to discuss it later. It hasn't been left. It, it hasn't been forgotten. This hasn't shut it down. This just means we will discuss it at a later date. We will discuss it later and we can even agree. Maybe we'll talk about it on Thursday night at seven o'clock or we'll talk about it Saturday morning over a coffee somewhere. Do you ever notice it's difficult to have an argument um, maybe in a coffee shop somewhere, especially a loud one? Um, you agree that you are going to talk about it's still not resolved but it will be resolved but what you're doing is you're taking the tension out of that now i'm just thinking as well when it comes to our own tension you think of the nervous energy now i don't know if it was the last podcast or the last uh, live stream or the one before that but there was an exercise i talked people through it's a very passive way of getting rid of unwanted energy you might have knots in your stomach you might have butterflies in your stomach. You might feel a lot of tension. The exercise is you find a quiet place. This is not a spectator sport, okay? You find a quiet place. Just lean your hands up against the wall. Lean against the wall with your feet apart and you push up through your body from the soles of your feet up into your stomach, up into your shoulders, and you push into the wall. And as you're doing that, you try to visualize tension, fear, anxiety, stress, whatever it is. Try to visualize that, just dissipating into the wall harmlessly. It's a very passive way of getting rid of the energy. Now, it doesn't make the conversation any less difficult, but sometimes it might be a little easier to do without the energy that comes with it. Again, going back to the I'm strong and powerful sort of thing, the, the inner narratives. But if you need to take a break, as I say, you take a break. Don't put yourself in any unnecessary danger. You're not trying to antagonize someone. Okay. Now, the, the kind of conversations you might need to have, but you think of the conversations that people have with you. Sometimes you get accused of things. You get insulted. You get made fun of. You, you get blamed on things. Or even if it's a conversation that you've tried to have and it gets shifted around and it gets turned, in, turned on you about the things that are wrong with you. It is important to keep it focused on what the actual issue is. If that's the case, you keep repeating the same issue. But if they are attacking you, they're criticizing you, if they're saying things to you, again, it can be very hard not to be defensive. Again, our, our shields go up. Now, when we get defensive, sometimes we might lash out. Sometimes we might be sarcastic. Sometimes we might be so angry. We end up using bad language or whatever. The argument tends to be lost. It's still left unresolved. Now, and this is the thing about um, about listening, actively listening and asking for questions. There's an example I sometimes use. I call it the stupid bag. Okay, not a nice term, but bear with me. It's the stupid bag. It's like someone says you're stupid. Stupid's not a bad word until you get called it. And then it's probably one of the worst things you'll ever hear. So if you imagine someone calls you stupid, what they've just done is they've just handed you this big bag of rocks and it says stupid on it. And what we do is we take the bag. Now, as soon as we get the bag, we try to give it back. I'm not stupid. I'm actually quite smart. Or I'm not stupid. You're stupid. They don't need to take the bag back. They've already given you it chances are they've got another load of bags just waiting to give you now what happens is again the inner narrative what happens is 
we go away, we'll go home, we go to our room, whatever it is. And we're sitting there holding this bag that says stupid on it. And we keep looking at it. And for the rest of the day, the rest of the week, the rest of the evening, whenever it is, you know, we're walking the dog, we're having our dinner, we're having a bath. We keep lifting this bag and looking at it. It says stupid on it. And we start thinking, stupid, call them. I'll show them who's stupid. But one way or another, we're left with this bag that isn't ours in the first place. The next time you're in the company of that person, you're already holding the bag, just as they're about to hand you another one. Before you know it, you're carrying dozens of bags. When someone says something like that, you imagine they're giving you something, they're giving you that bag. Again, this is not about being antagonistic. This is not about being passive aggressive. This is not about being rude. But is it unreasonable to ask them why you should take the bag? It's not your bag. Why should you take it? So they say you're stupid. There's probably better ways of phrasing these questions, but could you not ask, well, what do you mean by stupid? Give me an example of when I've been stupid. What is it you think is stupid? So why? what is it you think I should do? Well, why would I do that? How would it be different? How would that help? Again, you're not trying to antagonize, but what you're trying to do, remember the act of listening. You're trying to pay attention because you just might learn something. Some people, even though they're incredibly poor at how they do it, some people might genuinely have something to say. All right, you're not stupid. It's just that what you're doing is not going to work. I tried it, it blew up in my face. Now you've just learned something. Other times you're just left with someone who's pulled in this bag, it's their own bag, and they're saying, well, you just take the damn bag. No, you explain to me why I should take that bag. It's not mine. You're just asking for clarity. You're asking for examples. On the off chance, as I say, you might learn something. But as I say, you're not trying to antagonize someone. That's the important thing here. If you are having that conversation and they are doing a lot of deflection, a lot of distraction, there's a lot of circular reasoning. There's straw manning. Now, straw manning, uh, for people that aren't familiar, that's when you say something and someone takes something that you've just said and says it back to you completely out of context. Either that or they give it a meaning it didn't mean. For instance, do you like tea or coffee? Well, I like coffee. Okay. So you're saying you hate people who drink tea. That's a straw man argument. Person is now having to defend themselves for against something they never said in the first place, something it doesn't mean. Being clear and concise, there's different ways to handle this. You can just repeat the same thing. No, I said I prefer coffee. You can use the same technique with the bag. You can ask, you know, help me understand how you get there from here. I mean, I, I prefer tea. Sometimes I drink coffee. I mean, what? help me understand what you mean. You're giving them the opportunity. You're actually, you're getting them to do their own work. You're not doing it for them. And you're keeping it on the topic at hand. They're the ones going all over the place. Not you. You're not the one running around on the hamster wheel. There are different questions you can ask. You can ask, how did that come across? What is it you think I said? Help me understand how you heard that. Again, there's different ways you can phrase these questions, probably better than the way I'm phrasing them, depending on the situation, of course. But what you're doing, as I say, you're not getting caught up in the nonsense. You're not getting caught up in the um, gravity was invented by leopards kind of conversations. You're not getting involved in that. What you're doing is you're being curious. You're wondering why they see things differently. Again, sooner or later, they might run out of steam. You might get to some kind of resolution. As I said earlier, you let them own their own stuff. It's all their own stuff. You make me feel. No, we don't make people feel anything. You can throw a stone at someone or you can tickle them, they'll feel that, but we don't make people feel certain things, nor do we make people do certain things. But above all, this is the important thing about having a difficult conversation. If it's going to be difficult, you're being honest why it's difficult. If there's going to be things like narcissistic rage and so on, then yes, it's going to be very difficult. So you always make sure you're safe. You pick your battles. Is it one worth having?
Other times it might just be difficult because you fear being rejected. You fear hurting someone. You fear offending someone. Um, you fear getting it wrong. You fear making mistakes. And if that's the case, there is a book, and I will, I'll put it in the link to this description. There's a book that I think it's a great book. Um, it's just called How to Stand Up for Yourself. And it's by uh, Paul Hawk. It's a very, very good book. It's written plain, simple English, my kind of book. Plain, simple English. And he gives really good examples of the reasons why we don't assert ourselves, why we fear standing up for ourselves in different power dynamics, relationships, and so on. And the biggest one, I suppose, being we fear it's not going to work. We fear we're going to fail. It's going to get worse. We're going to get punished. We're going to be rejected. But I'm not going to ruin the book for you. But what I like about how he, he works through things in his book and the examples, he reinforces, of course, you're going to get it wrong. You're supposed to get it wrong. We never learn anything unless we get it wrong. We have to practice. We have to try. We 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 learn from our successes, but we also have to learn from where we went wrong. We have to learn from our mistakes. Um, we can also practice. Practice with people you feel safe and comfortable with. You tell them, I might sound a bit odd, but here's what I'm doing. Um, you practice with them. As I always say, if you don't have anyone to practice with, use the bathroom mirror. Just use the bathroom mirror. You know, you stand in front of it. What do you look like? when you're being strong and powerful. What do you look like when you're standing with your back straight? You just practice. And when you are having your difficult conversations, you pay attention to what's working and what isn't. You pay attention, you're listening to them every bit as much as you're hoping you're being listened to. If you feel you're not being listened to, if they are straw manning, if they give them, give them a chance because they might have misunderstood. Um, so you can repeat what it is you actually meant. You keep to the issue at hand, you keep to the outcome you would prefer and try not to personalize it. And I suppose we often, I often say human beings don't like things that don't make sense. We don't like, like things that don't sit well. That's why we often ruminate and analyze. So if you think of every difficult conversation you never had, that you backed away from and you regret it. If you think of every co difficult conversation you did have and it didn't go the way you would have hoped, pay attention to why. And also, you're using your imagination here. If you're gonna be thinking about it anyway, how would you have liked it to have went? What was the outcome you would preferred? The outcome you would preferred without someone being defeated, someone being humiliated, someone being crushed. You just got what it was you needed. Whatever it was was addressed, you got your point across. You think about how that conversation, how you could have had that conversation and it would have handled differently. The one where you didn't back down, the one where you didn't apologize, the one where you didn't look at your feet and ended up worse. Because if you think about it, having that conversation, think of it this way. Everything you do is going to have a consequence. It's gonna have an outcome of some kind. It could be positive, could be negative, could be both, could be a mixture. But everything you don't do is going to have a consequence. And that's the same. It could be positive, could be negative, could be a bit of both. It could be longer term gains, a short term pain for a longer term gain. When you pay attention to the consequences on both sides, you can make a balanced decision and you can choose your consequences. Sometimes the consequences may be painful. So what you do is you choose your pain. It's not always, unfortunately, we can't always get through something pain free. But even that pain or those consequences, think about them, they might be short term. The long term pain might, might be well worth it. Assertiveness, think of defense mechanisms. A lot of stuff, a lot of stuff comes up. I mentioned about being defensive in, in, in difficult conversations. I sometimes think of being assertive as a defense mechanism. 
but it's defensive in the sense that it's a it's an adult one it's an appropriate one it's it's um it gives us do you know what i need to start that again a defense mechanism a defense mechanism is an unconscious thing it's an automatic thing it kicks in and it kicks in to protect us from thinking and feeling things that are very uncomfortable from experiencing things that are uncomfortable. Sometimes they're not that appropriate. Sometimes they're a bit immature. Sometimes they only get us out of a short-term difficulty, but they could lead to longer-term pain. A lot of narcissistic defense mechanisms are quite maladaptive in the sense that they get them out, as I said earlier, about thinking in the here and now. It gets them out of a moment's distress, but in the longer term, it causes them more pain. I think narcissistic people are every bit, if not more so, destructive to themselves than they are to the people around them. Assertiveness, I would think of as a defense mechanism. And what I mean by that is when we're being assertive, we're being clear, we're being concise, we're being honest. We're talking about what we want, what we don't want, what we need, what we don't need, what's helpful, what isn't. And we may have to go through short-term pain in order to get that but it's for a longer term gain we're preventing something painful happening in the long term by facing something short term now other people might disagree when i say that i think of it as a defense mechanism but that's just how i see it short-term pain for a longer term gain okay so you think of every conversation, as I say, that you had that didn't go the way you would have liked and the conversations you wish you had had, but you didn't, but you try to imagine having them assertively where you got what you needed. You got what you wanted. You put a stop to something. And it might have been painful. It might have been difficult. But in the longer term, you were maybe thanking yourself for it. So you're just thinking about it a little bit differently. That's all sometimes thinking about the same thing just thinking about it differently it's a form of reframing if you will so i'm going to leave you with just some ideas that are helpful and some ideas that aren't i can't remember who gave me this someone gave me this sheet here they gave me this sheet a while ago um they call it rules of engagement it sounds quite sort of you know tactical and makes me think of battle and things like that but rules of engagement the things that are helpful is to talk about what you think and feel. Talk about what's important. You stick to one issue at a time. Again, it's a habit, narcissistic people, but we can sometimes do it as well. But pretty much everybody can do it. When passions are running high, and especially if it's something we haven't talked about because we keep putting it off, there's so much there. Sometimes it just comes out. It's all over the place. But we stick to one issue at a time. That's what we want resolved, the one thing at a time it's easier to sit down and talk than it is to stand up and shout okay just like it's not easy to shake hands with a clenched fist so you think about sitting down and talking rather than standing and shouting and being aggressive the important thing is as i said earlier as well you listen it is important to listen just like that guy i tell you that sells cars you listen to the customer you listen to everything they're saying. It doesn't matter what names they're calling you. It doesn't matter how they're slandering your character, your reputation. You listen to everything they have to say. You even take notes. He says he takes notes if he has to, because they're the things that he has. He's taken notes about the car, the things that are wrong with the car. They're the things he might be able to address, not necessarily the other stuff. So you listen, and you listen because you might learn something. You listen because you might pick up on things that aren't necessarily there in the tone of voice in the body language you make eye contact but you don't glare you don't stare you're not trying to intimidate you're not trying to hypnotize them you're not doing a jedi mind trick or something you make eye contact you show them that you're listening you be calm you be relaxed and sometimes be open to compromise so we might not get a hundred percent of what we want but we could well get maybe 50, 60% of what we need. The other stuff might come later. So it's a little piece at a time. You take responsibility for your own actions, your own thoughts and your own feelings. And you don't take responsibility 
for their words, their actions, or their feelings. It's personal responsibility. As much as there's joint and collective responsibility, there is still personal responsibility. Focus on solutions. Again, a narcissistic person is, is focusing on a victory. If you focus on a solution, again, maybe that's a little bit of an advantage to you. And you take whatever time is needed. Don't try and have this resolved in two sentences. Don't try, try and have this resolved. Sometimes some discussions can go on for days at a time, maybe a week or two. But sooner or later, we can come to a resolution. So there are some of the things that are helpful. The things that are unhelpful is not to be making fun of anybody, not to be drawing attention to something, not to be sarcastic, witty, passive aggressive. These things are good in movies, but not necessarily in real life. No physical threats. Again, if the other person is physically threatening you, I don't generally give advice, but the best advice I could give is if someone's been physically threatening to you, Get out of that situation quick. Don't be pulling faces, attacking personalities, name calling, insulting. Narcissistic people often focus on the past. Something you said 10 years ago still bothers them today and is a reason why they shouldn't have to talk about whatever it is you're talking about today. You keep that focused in the here and now. But even if you start bringing up stuff from the past as well, that's not necessarily going to be helpful. It could be, there could be a context to it because it could be something historical. So maybe that's different. But if we keep bringing up stuff from the past, chances are we're not going to get anywhere. Don't try and get the last word. This is the thing about the last word. It took me a long time to learn this. I used to think I was beaten every single time or whatever, but getting the last word in an argument doesn't mean you're right. Getting the last word in an argument doesn't mean you've won. In some cases, getting the last word in an argument, all that means is you got the other person to shut up. That's not the same as winning. So don't depend too much on getting the last word. You still get what you wanted. You still get to say what you needed. It's okay to leave it at that. Try not to use absolute words like always this, never that. Again, narcissistic people tend to do this. Um, you're always like this. You're never like that. It's always whatever. Here we go again. Again, nothing's actually being resolved. There's just so much there in the mix. You try and keep it on one thing at a time. Be specific about what it is you're talking about. None of these things I'm saying are necessarily going to make these conversations easy. Hopefully, they might make them just a little bit easier. That's the thing. It's just about making them easier. I'm going to say about things like avoidance, that we, there's no, no such thing as a good time for a difficult conversation. If you ask yourself what might make it just a little bit easier, if it was like in a workplace, for example, having someone else present, like workplace mediation or having somebody present, not to take sides, not the gang up, but someone there, that might make it a bit easier. The trying to get rid of the access energy, that might make it a little bit easier. If you have bullet points that you want to discuss, now you don't have to pull out your list and read it to someone, but if you have a bullet point list of things that are important and need to be discussed, that might be helpful. There's less chance of it going all over the place and other things being thrown into the mix. So it's not always what makes it easy. It could be what makes it easier. And if you don't get what you want this time, nothing stop you from trying again. So that's pretty much what I have tonight on rules of engagement. As always, there's going to be more uh, other stuff, other ideas. I would encourage people, um, as always, use the comment section, use the chat um, to give each other ideas, share ideas. You know, this is the thing. People learn from each other. This is the thing about listening. People learn from each other all the time. They learn something that works. They learn something that doesn't work. Um, you don't always have to rely on someone like me that thinks they know it all, because I can assure you I don't. Um, I'm just going to go through the questions. I'm going to see if there's anything tonight I could answer. Perhaps me. Everybody saying hello. Yes, it's 
nice to say, nice to see you, Gypsy Little. Nice to see you, uh, Viviana. Okay, listen, consider I prefer is rarely what I get. I get to listen, then cave or walk away. I'm the master of walking away. Gypsy Little, that is something, um, it's common with all of us. When we lack assertiveness, we're so used to being talked down. We're so used to having boundaries trampled. We might be so used to be told how wrong we are. Think of some of the things I said in this. It's about paying attention to why it's important, what might make it easier. You think of the outcome that you would want. Think as well of that inner narrative. If you're walking away, what is the inner narrative there? And I can't tell you that. Only you can know that. If you're, if you're talking with a therapist or someone like that, they might help you uncover what is that inner narrative. Is it um, it's easier to walk away? That could be because that's not uncommon. But I would challenge that in saying it feels easier. That's not the same as it is easier. It feels easier. Think of the longer term gain, short term pain in order to get longer gain and finding ways. Again, it could be talking with a therapist. It could be reading books like the one I'll put in the description, um, listening to other people's examples, and it could be learning from your mistakes. But what is it makes it easier not to walk away? Sometimes you might have to walk away. Sometimes it's going to be the safest thing to do. Sometimes it might be the best thing to do, but not every single time. Good morning from New Zealand. Uh, good morning, Six Sense Amelia. Oh, and thank you very much, Six Sense Amelia. Coercive controls for real, they cause confusion and then nag, non verbal nag. Yeah, nagging is a difficult one to deal with. Um, absolutely, it's it's the constant criticism. There's almost like a, a contempt um, for thoughts and feelings, things like that. Nagging is difficult. We're often left thinking, feeling, believing there is something wrong with us. We never do anything right. That's where sometimes if we, as hard as it is, listen to the nagging. Because then we can ask questions like, why is that important? What does that even mean? Why would I do it like that? Again, think of the stupid bag. Um, but as always, make sure you're safe. I can't emphasize that enough. Mirroring properly should prove we're listening and understanding. Yep, absolutely. Mirroring. Deflection is a form of control. It can be, yeah. It can be. It controls the narrative. It shifts the narrative somewhere else. It shifts the focus somewhere else. So it's controlling in that sense. Yeah, that's why I think it's important. We just keep saying the same thing. We keep bringing it back to what the actual issue is, what the resolution we're hoping for, what the outcome is. We just keep bringing it back to where it needs to be. Thank you, my handsome therapist. Oh my goodness, I'm blushing now. You wouldn't have said that if you saw me earlier. I've taken this allergic reaction. Um, you call me stupid and I'll laugh hysterically. That's one thing I'm not. You're right. Um, don't believe everything you hear. Don't believe everything you think. And don't believe everything other people believe. Learn not to take on other people's projections. Most people tend to be emotionally stunted. Yeah, that's quite true. A lot of the research shows they seem to be stuck at a certain age. Sometimes it's um, they get as far, develop emotionally only so far and then tend to get stuck there. I've heard, and this is anecdotally, I haven't actually read any research in this. I haven't heard it phrased this way, but I have heard people saying that sometimes you're dealing with maybe a 30 year old in a 14 year, uh, or sorry, you're dealing with a four, emotionally a 14 year old in a 30 year old's body. Um, that, that kind of concept. Um, I like to tell an arse, you can call me a hippo if you want, no matter. I'll still never be a hippo. You're absolutely right. Saying a thing does not make it so. Sample I often use, if someone called you a helicopter, would it make you a helicopter? Are you going to start growing propellers, hovering above the ground? Saying a thing does not make it so. Doesn't mean it doesn't hurt, but it doesn't make it so. Thank you for your contact. You're very welcome, Reggie Mass. I'm glad you find it helpful. Don't agree about picking bottles. The real bottles of my life are the ones who have picked me. That can be the case. That's why I was saying earlier on about sometimes people People might attack us, they accuse us of things, and it's maybe how we defend ourselves, how we be assertive, how we be assertive. Um, 
there are going to be times when maybe we do have to stand up for ourselves. We do have to say something. That's what I mean about picking the battles. Um, monster toddlers. It's another way of looking at them. Giant toddler behavior, age inappropriate. I hate our conversations because I have to play defense rather than relax and have a normal talk. They've lessened because like this, like I have to be ready for something at all times. You're always ready for an attack. There are four behaviors present sometimes in really difficult uh, conversations, sorry, difficult relationships. One is defensiveness. One is being contemptuous. One is stonewalling. And uh, what's the last one? I think I should know this. I say it often enough. It's too late at night and I haven't had enough coffee. Um, there's also, before all of this comes, it usually is because we fear someone's reaction. When we fear someone's reactions to something, we don't speak up. We don't say anything. We fear how they're going to take it. That can lead to being defensive. That can lead to silent treatment. That can lead to, or, sorry, stonewalling, rather. Silent treatment is something different. Um, we fear we're going to be treated with contempt. If you're in a relationship like that, nothing's ever really getting resolved. Now, it depends on the person. You might benefit from seeing someone together, relationship counseling. They might need to hear what it is you have to say, whether they like it or not. But you might need to hear what it's like for them as well. Sometimes having an impartial in person in the room can help two people to have a difficult conversation. Um, nothing wrong with self-defense really pisses them off. I think we're being being defensive is difficult. It's different from self-defense. When we're being when we're talking about self-defense, we are defending ourselves. We are again. I'm not talking about karate or something. Um, we're being clear, we're being concise, we're being assertive. Being defensive is different um, when we talk about defense mechanisms, as I say. Um, they're, it's like they're automatic. They, they kick in. They're unconscious. Sometimes they're out before we even think about them. We don't even know we're doing them. So that's the difference between self-defense and defense mechanisms. Being assertive has nothing to do with shouting. It's being calm and stating the facts, not wavering. Absolutely, yeah. It's just being clear and concise. It's all it is. It's being honest. It's being confident enough, confident enough to state your position. It's also having the humility. The other thing about assertiveness, I think, it's having the humility to acknowledge we don't know everything. We might learn something new. And there are occasions when we are wrong. We can have enough humility to apologize when you were wrong. Narcissists don't do so well with humility. Uh, let me see. Thanks for dealing with this important topic. It's okay, Yvette. I'm glad you found something helpful tonight. Good to have a kit bag of go skills, go to skills. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think a lot of the time, Sometimes we didn't learn these skills maybe in early age, maybe in our formative years, even in our teenage years. We didn't necessarily learn them. Now, we maybe didn't learn them because, not because it was anything bad happening. It's just that we might not have been in the environment where we would have had to use them. Other times, uh, we may have had them, but in a long-term kind of relationship, those things get chipped away at a little piece at a time. And it's almost like we think we've lost them, we've forgotten them. And it's good to tap into them again once in a while if not learn new ones and susan parker thank you so much that's very kind of you i really appreciate that um you fear the person will de detonate when you confront them sometimes that's the case yeah um sometimes we fear like a narcissistic rage as i say they may explode other times they may implode it's it's like we fear we have hurt them they just want the world to end you know um how could you do this to me and all that sort of thing so we feel guilty for having hurt them so yeah again it's paying attention to what the actual fear is and 
when we understand what the fear is, when we understand things like responsibility and ownership, it's not that we're doing something to someone by asking them or saying no or whatever. I think I said this in the last time. It's recognizing the difference between caring about and caring for. Two different things. We can care about, we can empathize that they're upset, but we don't own that. We didn't do it to them. Uh, clear and concise, yeah. Reasonable concern with narcissist. The rage is real. It can be very real. That's why I say you always make yourself, always make sure you're safe. You're not trying to antagonize. You're not trying to start a fight. You're not trying to start a World War Three. That's not what you're doing. And if that person has a history of being aggressive, even especially if they have a history of being violent, I don't think um, having any kind of assertive conversation, certainly with my, without someone else present, so you know you're safe, um, maybe that's not a good idea. And again, when I talk about picking your battles, that's not necessarily a battle you're going to win. If someone is going to be abusive, violent and aggressive, you keep yourself safe. Tell all the community, I like reading everyone's I like reading comments too. That's why I always leave it to the end. Um, but listen, I have pretty much come to the end of this evening. And as always, I do hope you find this helpful. I will put um, the name of that book and the author in the description, How to Stand Up for Yourself. If anybody wants to get it, it is, it is a good book. Um, tomorrow night, and I'm hoping it's tomorrow night. I'm running a bit behind uh, schedule here. Tomorrow night, I have a video coming out. Um, question that's come up quite a few times over particularly in the last few months um the difference between narcissistic abuse and narcissistic neglect there is a lot to cover so i've decided to break it into two in the first part of the video i'm going to be looking at what neglect is in, in terms of narcissism the difference between that and abuse and when i suppose the neglect spills in to abuse I'm going to look at some of the common ways in which neglect can come up in a relationship. In the second part of the video, I'm going to be looking at, because I've talked before about the impact of narcissistic abuse, I'm going to talk about the impact of narcissistic neglect, what that can do to someone. So I hope that you find that helpful. And as always, stuff I'm talking about tonight, it's going to be a lot more helpful to you. If you're getting some kind of support, counseling, coaching, support group work, whatever, these are just a few ideas, not necessarily therapy in and of itself, but they might help you. Utilize as much, as many, rather, as many resources as you can get. And I'd like to thank everyone for coming along tonight and do me a big favor. And if you click like on the video and stuff like that, leave a wee comment and share your ideas with each other as well. What you find helpful and what you don't someone if you feel safe enough to do it by the way because someone somewhere just might benefit from your wisdom and your experience and i think that can be quite priceless there is the, i don't think you could put a price on that so um until next time again it's going to be in another 10 days i think it's 10 days which is going to be on a wednesday not wednesday coming but the wednesday after until then everybody look after yourselves and take care